On September 10th, the President and CEO of the Toronto Foundation tweeted that he looked forward to sharing a very important story about Toronto with the Canadian Club of Toronto. One month later, here we are, eager to hear that story. We are proud that Canada's podium of record is the launching pad for the release of the annual Vital Signs Report. The Toronto Foundation is one of 191 community foundations in Canada. Since 1981, this independent, charitable foundation has been connecting philanthropy to community needs and opportunities. Individual and family fund holders support local and national causes through grants to any registered Canadian charity. The foundation now has more than 500 active funds. These include endowments and assets under administration of more than 300 million. Many Torontonians support the Vital Toronto Fund, the community endowment that helps mobilize people and resources to address local challenges in innovative and inspiring ways. The annual Vital Signs Report is a mobilization call, always revealing and sobering. The annual report reaches more than one million people across the greater Toronto area, and its model has been adopted by communities around the world. The report's chief messenger is Raoul Bardwaj. As the president and CEO of the Toronto Foundation, you find in this former corporate lawyer a passionate advocate and champion of the world's fourth most livable city. That stat, according to The Economist. He devotes his time to a number of initiatives, each designed to make our city better. Whether as a board member of the transit strategy organization Metrolinx, or as the chair of the Community Foundations of Canada, Mr. Bardwaj lives and breathes philanthropy and civic engagement. I invite him now to our podium to engage us with this very important story. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Jennifer. And thank you to the Canadian Club of Toronto for providing a platform where the issues of the nation's largest city can be given the best possible audience and discussion. And a big shout out to our friends from Mars, the Discovery District. Are they here today? Our studio-wide gen leaders of tomorrow, welcome. Now, they're a pretty bright lot. And a lot like you, I'm thinking they probably know the answer to this question. Why did the Canadian cross the road? To get to the middle, right? <laughs> now that answer is, test, is actually a part of a citizenship test. But as vital signs will tell us today, the middle of the road will not help us anymore. If we huddle in the middle, we'll just get run over. We need to cross to the other side and fast. Thirteen years ago, the Toronto Foundation issued its first annual report card on the quality of life in our city. Since then, Vital Signs has grown, both in scope and in influence. It's being modeled by 27 other community foundations across Canada this year, 11 in Great Britain, six other countries, including Brazil. Now, its methodology of directing support to areas of concern identified by an annual report card, well, that's now called the Toronto Model of Philanthropy. And we have delegations flying in from other countries just to learn about how we do philanthropy in Toronto differently. Now, during those 13 years, Toronto has also grown in scope and influence. In fact, we're no longer on the verge of becoming one of the world's great cities. It's about time we recognize we are. Virtually every survey puts Toronto near or at the top in terms of livability. Now, it's important to remember just how important this really is. 
There are close to 500 cities in the world with a population of 1 million or more. And Toronto is nearly always in the top 10. Now we can cheer some of the most important numbers from this year's Vital Signs Report. Our air is cleaner than it was 10 years ago. And this summer, we didn't have a single smog alert day for the first time in decades. Now, new records were set in the Toronto region for overseas visitors. The combined spending of more than $6.5 billion to our economy is up from $4.7 billion two years ago. For the seventh year running, Toronto's region's crime rate has dropped by 7% alone over last year, notwithstanding the terrible, terrible violence we're seeing in our neighbourhoods these days. But notwithstanding that, there are now 32 Canadian cities that are less safe than Toronto, and our murder rate of 57 homicides against the 56 homicides in 2012 is nowhere near the level of American cities similar to Toronto, such as Chicago, with 415 homicides, the lowest since 1965. Now, we continue to build more buildings than New York City. At the same time, Toronto costs less than all but two of North America's 36 biggest cities when it comes to setting up a business. And during rush hour on College Street in Toronto, there are now as many cyclists in the bike lanes as there are cars on the road, and that number is rising. Little wonder so many talented people are flocking to put down roots here. In fact, the number of Torontonians born outside Canada has now tipped beyond the number born here. Our city's population is now over 51% foreign-born. Our ability to be so diverse, peaceable, and productive is the envy of the world. I'll tell you, bigger, more famous cities would trade their problems for ours in a New York minute. I mean, when Vogue magazine names Queen Street West as the second hippest district in the world, you know you've arrived. <laughs> so we have every reason to be proud. As we said in past reports, the world needs Toronto to succeed. But while some of the trends in this year's Vital Signs were point, a point up, Others are headed sharply in the other direction. Now, if you've heard me report on vital signs in the past, it pretty well went like this. Here's some good news. Here's some bad news. And on balance, we could do better, but we're okay. We're in the middle of the road. But not today. Because this year's vital signs places us at a tipping point. One we've not come near, certainly not in the 13 years that the Toronto Foundation has been issuing this report and I suspect for many years before that. The trends reported in this year's vital signs reveal a more worrisome state for the city. We have problems that have now grown and festered until they now threaten our very vaunted livability. If we don't take action now, the city we're so proud of will succumb to squandered opportunities, fading prospects, and some serious societal divisions. Because this is also the year that the fault lines in our city, between the haves and the have-nots, between the educated and the not, the employed and not, the immigrant and not, between the car people and the transit people, between the shrill voices of wedge politics at City Hall, make it harder than ever to even spark a conversation, let alone hammer out any solutions to our chronic problems. Clearly, our willful blindness to these problems is caused in part by lack of vision for what our city can become. But if we ever needed to gather behind a vision of what our city is and can be, it is now. Proverbs said it one way, where there is no vision, the people perish. Lincoln said it another way, a house divided against itself cannot stand. But don't get me wrong. Lots of people and organizations, many in this room, have worked incredibly hard with great vision to make Toronto a great global city. From George Brown College, our research partner for Vital Signs, to our universities, TIFF, Mars, Nui Blanche, and TO 2015 staging the Pan Am Games last year. But one of those groups is also one we tend to dismiss. 
Instead, we should be applauding the women and the men who work for our city and run it so competently. You do not create the fourth most livable city on the planet for six years in a row without a very strong public service. Now, one of the reasons... Now, one of the reasons Toronto has avoided many of the tough decisions it must now make is precisely because they are so intertwined with each other, one spilling over into the other. The truth is, Toronto doesn't have any simple problems anymore. If we did, we could have solved them with simple solutions. We have only complex problems whose answers demand a different kind of thinking than what created them in the first place. So the first thing that we need to do in order to hammer out any common vision for the future is to view our current problems in an entirely new light. Now, how? By viewing our personal health, for example, not just as a health issue, but as a transit issue. We need to view poverty as a health issue and women's underemployment as a human rights issue. We even need to see the good things, like Toronto's remarkably high high school graduation rate, not just as a single superlative, but as part of a much bigger conversation around access, opportunity, and competitiveness. So the transit people, they need to sit at the same table as the health people, along with the safety people, the education people, and so on. We need to learn exactly how cooperation can get us a lot farther and faster than competition. We need to trust each other enough to collaborate with each other. And most of all, we need strong leadership to use these complex, messy, difficult conversations to solve these complex, messy, difficult problems we face. Now, the fact that this kind of leadership and problem solving rarely happened in Toronto is the best argument I know to force it now. The idea of breaking down silos is already revolutionizing the worlds of science, healthcare, and business. So why not city building? Let me give you a few examples of what I mean. Take obesity and diabetes. Vital signs reveals that where you live in Toronto affects your health a lot. If you live downtown, small blocks, lots of shops and people, you're twice as likely to walk, bike, or take public transit. But if you live in our inner suburbs, areas that encourage driving and discourage walking, you're one-third more likely to be obese or have diabetes. So transit is a health issue. Now, we all know that being poor is bad for your health. But what Vital Signs also uncovered this year is that residents of cities with more equal income distribution are likely to live longer, be less prone to obesity and addiction, trust each other more, and commit less crime. Now, income disparity is a growing global problem, but we feel it particularly in rich countries like Canada and rich cities like Toronto, which has the second highest gap in Canada between the top 1% and the rest. So let's add income disparity, that rumbling distance between the rich and the poor, to our list of long-term issues. Now, disparity may not rule in Toronto, but it's gaining a lot of ground in education. Last month, the OECD revealed that more Canadians have a post-secondary education than any other country in the developed world. Now, the GTA also has one of the highest percentages of high school graduates anywhere, with almost 60% over the age of 15 having completed high school. Now, do all those A's translate into a job? Sadly, no. In 2009, the unemployment rate for Torontonians under 25, well, it skyrocketed to 18%. Where is it now? Almost 20%. But make that 27% if you're an immigrant youth. Toronto is producing a record number of college and university graduates, and far too many of them graduate into the workplace without a job, let alone a career, and often with only a hefty student loan to show for it. Which brings me to women in the workplace. For many, this issue, 
is about getting more women into senior management positions and onto corporate boards. But look outside of the glass towers for a moment, where vital signs reveals that the pay gap between genders, it isn't shrinking at all, it's growing. Equal pay day, that's the date that symbolizes a woman, the date that a woman would need to work into the new year to make what a man earned the previous year. Now it's April 16th this year, it was April 9th last year, a year, a week later. In fact, women across Ontario still only make 68.5% cents for every man's dollar. This means that over the course of a career, a woman has to work 14 years longer in order to make what a man does by age 65. 14 years. That disparity is cause for despair. Now, I offer you these four examples from Vital Signs. Obesity and diabetes, poverty, education, and gender inequality, simply to show that while the risk of doing nothing to solve them is clear to all of us, the risk of treating every problem as a single, separate jar in the cupboard is that our response will not only be ineffectual, it will almost certainly create an equal and opposite problem somewhere else. So, it's about time, ladies and gentlemen, for us to finally push back on some of our most aggressive problems. Toronto's on a roll, but all our momentum and our livability will be lost unless we act now, act together, and act because we love our city. So where do we need to act decisively and fast? Of all the red flags raised in this year's report, I want to dig down into three of them. They are traffic, affordable housing, and youth unemployment. Now, why these three? Because if we can crack them, we'll create a city where our youth can be proud and optimistic about their future. Now, it's more than just a legacy for our children. It's what leaders do. And it's about time that we acted like the leaders the world keeps insisting that we are. Now, last year, the average commute time in the GTA was longer than anywhere in North America except New York City. Now, we don't need numbers to prove that traffic is a mess all across the GTA. Getting to the luncheon at the convention center used to be a predictable, low-anxiety experience. <laughs> now, the entire city seems to be in a perpetual state of repair. This makes us late and drives us crazy. Worse, it makes planning a trip any longer than a couple of blocks risky business. Our 63 traffic fatalities last year were 43% higher than in 2012, and 60% of those deaths were seniors. Now, too much traffic kills in another way, by polluting our air and taking 500, year, 500 lives a year from respiratory illness. But the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on the Gardner and the 401 also has a big effect on our competitiveness as an urban region. It drives companies and jobs to other regions where an hour of your and my day isn't taken up getting to and from work. Now, the Toronto Region Board of Trade estimates the gridlock costs Toronto Region about $6 billion in lost productivity each year. So it's little wonder our productivity only grew by 0.4% last year. Now, we all know what's wrong. There are more cars on the road. Cars cost a lot. Roads cost a whole lot. And neither is good for the environment, our neighborhoods, or frankly, our livability. But what about public transit? Can that save us? Well, from 1950 to 1980, the region's population grew by nearly 2 million people. During those three decades, we built nearly 400 kilometers of commuter rail track. Yet from 1980 to 2010, our population nearly doubled to almost 6 million people, and only 43 kilometers of new track were laid. The TTC reports that 10 years ago, 405 million of us used the TTC. Last year, it was 525 million. Any system that's overtaxed tends to break down and costs more to fix and maintain when it does. Yet among mass transit systems, the same size across North America, 
Toronto has the smallest subsidy of all of them, with only 78 cents per fare paid by the city. Montreal, $1.16. Vancouver, $1.62. Now, the fact that transit has been the most talked about issue during the civic election, while that may not be good for getting all of the other questions asked and answered, but it does speak to how traffic has grown from a problem to a crisis to something that gobbles up billions and billions of our tax dollars to untangle. But what's not up for debate is that our transit system is a circulatory system that's old and clogged and simply running out of time to fix. Now, the issue of affordable housing, not so inflammatory in this room, maybe because so few of us here live in affordable housing or see it as a step up in our lives. But Vital Signs reports that today in Toronto, there are over 90,000 households waiting to get into an apartment whose rent is geared to their income. They can't possibly afford to rent the space they need in one of the most overheated housing markets in the world. So they double up, jamming six into a one bedroom, or they live on the street, or they leave their jobs and flee to another city. And if you're one of those 90,000 households, let's say around 200, 200,000 people, you'll wait six years, that's till 2020, to get into affordable housing. That's as long as it took for somebody in Soviet Russia to get a telephone. But the lack of affordable housing brings us face to face with an even bigger problem. Vital Signs reveals that nine out of 10 families with children, you heard that correctly, 90% living in Toronto's aging high rise apartments in low-income neighborhoods like Regent Park, St. Jamestown, are at real risk of homelessness. We know right. why, right? They don't have any jobs. They don't have any education. Wrong. It seems that neither education nor employment offers much protection to these families. 56% of the parents have post-secondary education, and two, fully two-thirds of them are employed. Yet 70% of them are living below the low-income cutoff line of $37,000 a year for a family of four. If you're an immigrant, those numbers are worse. If you're a recent immigrant, they're much, much worse. So it turns out that the urban myth of the PhD from India forced to drive a cab, that's no myth at all. It's a billion dollar opportunity lost. In fact, failing to recognize the qualifications and experience of immigrants cost the GTA between $1.5 and $2.25 billion a year in lost productivity. What an awful and needless waste. Especially when we learn that Toronto's child poverty rates are on the rise after a six-year decline. In 2012, 29% of the kids were living in poverty. And in 14 neighborhoods from Regent Park to Moss Park to Thorncliffe Park, that number was 40% and in some case, 50%. But that waste pales compared to the consequences of the third alarming issue in vital signs this year, persistently high youth unemployment. Again, like affordable housing, it's an issue largely unseen by many here. But its very invisibility makes it all the more dangerous. The immediate problem is that when a young person successfully navigates one of the best education systems on the planet, they still can't get a job when they graduate here. But even if you do eventually get a job, it will likely be low paying, part time, with very little prospect for advancement. So while over a little, over a million Torontonians were employed full time last year, just over 300,000 were employed part time. The growth in part-time jobs more than doubled the growth in full-time jobs. In fact, over the past 14 years, almost 30% of the new jobs in the GTA have been part-time. So it's no surprise that nearly one in five Toronto workers is in danger of losing their jobs. But there's a more pernicious problem here, and it's almost existential, because it strikes at the very cores of our value as a society. For generations, one of the Western civilization's most implicit assumptions is that if you get a good education, you will do well in the world. 
you have a chance at the brass ring, and someday you may be able to buy a house. Well, here in Toronto, one of the most successful cities on the earth, that assumption is no longer valid. Now, I'm certainly not saying that getting an education is a waste of time. What I am saying is that there's now a different kind of poverty that's stalking our city, one that's even more pernicious than being poor. It's a growing poverty of opportunity. Now, why is that poverty worse? While we continue to market Toronto's defining diversity as a competitive advantage, because more and different kinds of people make for more and better kinds of ideas and decisions. More opportunity for them means greater competitiveness for Toronto. Yet the reality is that we are still locking out huge numbers of people whose only goal in life is to get in the game. So how can the fourth most livable city on earth continue to lock out so many of its people? One, by being so late off the mark in solving our transit crisis. Secondly, by allowing youth unemployment to stay above 15% for the last 10 years in a row. And by failing to provide enough affordable housing in one of the most unaffordable housing markets on earth and forcing families to choose between paying the rent and feeding the kids. Is it that bad? Well, it's worse. For the fifth year running, there were over one million visits to GTA food banks. In the inner suburbs, their visits have gone up by 38% in six years alone. It's about time this stopped. More of us need to share in what makes this city great. Now, the Australians have a phrase for this, of letting everyone have a better chance, and we should listen to them, since they have five of the world's top ten cities. The phrase is, have a go. And it means that everyone should have a chance to take part, to work hard, and to do well. In fact, we're better at inclusion than most anywhere else on the planet. But better doesn't mean good. Better won't get us where we need to. Sure, we cheer when a student from a poor family gets a scholarship to go to law school. Or when an Indian born in Uganda rises to be CEO of one of Canada's largest banks. There are important advances on the true road to diversity. But that map has too many dead ends for too many people still defined by their gender or color or country of origin. A couple of years ago, I was invited by some youth workers to go visit them and talk about vital signs at Jane Finch. There were about 75 of them that day. The men really didn't say much, but the women were very vocal. One in particular stood up and said to me, we've got a problem with young men in our neighborhood. I said, sure, tell me about it. She said, we don't have leaders, we don't have mentors, and we don't have role models. And a remarkable discussion ensued from that. But it was the punchline that stuck in my mind, where at the end of it, she said to me, we know how to get rich. We don't know how to get private school rich. And all the heads in that room nodded. What she was saying was, we follow the rules, we get the education, but we still do not have the networks and the mentors to break in to the inner circle and break out of the cycle of poverty. If education is a hammer and it never meets its nail, opportunity, the result is a very frustrated group of young people. And their parents there share the same goals that we do. They want in. They just want to have a go. And because Vital Signs has identified real inclusion as such a high priority for the city, the Toronto Foundation has created a number of programs to do that very thing. Now, as you've heard, we are a knowledge company in the philanthropic sector, but more and more, we are a catalyst for bringing the public and private sectors together to create new solutions to the kinds of issues that Vital Signs has identified over the years. So in a word, we are a trust fund for the future of Toronto. Eight years ago, we started a program called the Toronto Sport Leadership Program. Now, clearly, one of the problems that young men have in tough neighborhoods is avoiding the lure of gangs and drugs. So we identified some kids who were on the verge of real trouble or struggling to find their way out of it. And we created a program where they could earn national-level sports certification in swimming and basketball. 
That certification not only kept them off the streets and turns them into terrific teachers and athletes, it gets them jobs as well as lifeguards and coaches. We couldn't do this alone. We approached our own fund holders and groups like the YMCA, United Way, MLSC, the school boards, the City of Toronto, and they all came to the table. Well, let me tell you, this year, the Toronto Sport Leadership had its 1,000th graduate. That's 1,000 youth with a more optimistic future. But what if sports is not your cup of tea? Well, in 2011, the foundation we crawled a program called Playing for Keeps, which is all about building stronger, healthier, better connected neighborhoods through play. Now, it's one thing to have good neighborhoods, and Toronto is known worldwide for the strength and resilience of our neighborhoods, but it's the connection between the neighbors that really gives those neighborhoods strength and resilience. So with the help of many of our partners, from Toronto Pearson to the Ontario Trillium Foundation to George Brown College, we've trained over 650 newcomers and longtime residents to be community ambassadors and create something very simple as neighborhood games. I'll give you an example of what a neighborhood game is all about. There's a ravine in the west end of Toronto, and on the one side is a neighborhood made up largely of newcomers to Canada. On the other side, longtime residents of Canada. And the kids know better than to go to the other side of the ravine. Then a woman from the longtime resident side gets up one day and decides to host a neighborhood game, of all things, in the middle of February. So what did she do? She invited these newcomers and their families and kids to come into the ravine to learn how to build a snowman, to help them in the vital step in becoming a Canadian. Like, where does the carrot go? Where do the charcoals go? <laughs> well, that game, it literally broke the ice between the two communities. And in building snowmen, they all got a life lesson in building community. Building social capital like this builds that sense of belonging, which begins the journey of building trust in each other and in our institutions, and the belief in a more positive future for our youth. There have now been over 600 neighborhood games with 20,000 participants, largely outside of downtown. And Playing for Keeps has become an Ignite program of Toronto 2015. It's building a social legacy for the Pan Am Games. Now, I've seeded the idea of vision throughout this speech, hinting at how absolutely necessary it is for Toronto to be the kind of city other cities look to. Now, it's tempting to fall back on the belief that somehow we got here without vision, that our success is a fluke or undeserved, but that's simply not the truth. Now, Toronto desperately and immediately needs the kind of political and ethical leadership that we can all draw inspiration and determination from. But vision doesn't just have to come from the top. Great ideas don't come from one person. Great ideas in pursuit of a vision can come from anywhere. That woman who started the snowman building game, she has vision, and she's stuck with her idea to make it happen. Her vision wasn't to transform Toronto. It was to make her street a little nicer to live on. But what she created was a model every street and every neighborhood of the city can adopt and make their own. And there are thousands of people like her. And when people get fed up enough or proud enough and don't see much happening at the top, they'll take matters into their own hands. So what can you do? Yes, you personally. How can you be a part of a vision for Toronto that will see us remain one of the most livable cities on the planet? Well, by acting on what we all know to be true, that civic responsibility grows out of personal responsibility. And if you think you're just one person, and what can you actually do? I will remind you of Margaret Mead's call to arms. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And we're seeing that happen a lot recently. This evening, Toronto's, Torontonians are gonna be hosting dinners in their homes for their neighborhoods and their friends. The goal of 1,000 Dinners Toronto is to discuss ways to improve the city 
over a bite to eat and discuss Toronto's vital signs to enhance their civic literacy. Those ideas are going to be shared with the city and the world. Now, some people are surprised that an idea that was hatched literally weeks ago has spread so fast and so deeply. Well, I'm not surprised. It exemplifies the spirit of get up and go ness that has made us the envy of the world. And it says to all of our leaders, if you're not going to tackle our problems, we will. Or because we're Canadians, we'll help you if you don't mind. <laughs> now, a few weeks ago, my wife Ritu and I, we attended the opening of the Aga Khan Museum and Ismaili Cultural Center. It is truly, truly remarkable. The Ismaili Muslims are a small but very important part of the Muslim world. And at the behest of their leader, the Aga Khan, many of them at a very difficult time of their history chose to call Canada their home. The Aga Khan could have directed its $300 million center to be built anywhere on earth, but he chose Toronto of all places. Why? It was built here mainly because the Ismailis have always been optimistic about the future, no matter how dark and dire it appeared to be over their thousand plus years of history. Canada's Ismailis in particular, who number about 90,000 of us, have felt a part of the wider community and part of an experiment in civic optimism and pluralism that's based on our idea of caring for each other. In one sense, we cared about them, and they in turn cared about us. And look what a wonder has been created. Now, the idea of unleashing our sense of caring and community to create a sense of civic vision, doesn't just happen in Toronto. Our Governor General, David Johnston, wants Canada to build smart and caring communities. He believes it's simply impossible to be a smart community without being a caring one. They go hand in hand. He also believes that if we start doing that at the level of the street where we live, then the neighborhood, then the city, then the region and the province, we won't have to worry about the country. So we have the snowman, the thousand dinners, the Ismaili Muslims who built the museum, and our governor general who wants us to build our country, one smart and caring community at a time. What these four all share is a sense of optimism about our future that's driven by a deep commitment to individual action. In fact, you can't have one without the other. If you don't think the future will be good or better, if you don't think there's nothing you can do to change, if you can't have a go, you're not going to care much and you'll detach from that future, from that community and your city. Ultimately, the result of pessimism is inaction. That's my greatest fear emerging from this year's Vital Sides, that the fault lines in our civic society will continue to grow because we think our problems are too big, too complex, or too late to solve. They are none of those. Toronto is an extraordinary place of huge promise. But now is the time we all need to act. The time to wait for your neighbor, or city hall, or somebody to please do something about that. Well, it's about time, ladies and gentlemen, because that time is well truly gone. Now, I remember my high school teacher in London, Ontario, once told me there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who say, what the heck just happened? <laughs> now, the greatest tragedy of our city could face for its leaders is if you, me, and us became the people who said, what just happened? But let me tell you what the greatest triumph could be. That we can find it within ourselves to get informed, then get engaged in the city we live in and really need to love a whole lot more. We can then truly build not only our legacy, but what we all want for our kids. For them to live in a proud city and be optimistic about their future. And I invite you to join the Toronto Foundation in that task. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about time. And thank you very much for your time today.
Thank you, Raul. I'd now like to call upon Ryan McNally, head of GTA BMO's private bank, to say a few words. Jennifer, thank you to you and the Canadian Club of Toronto for your warm hospitality today. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan McNally. I'm the head of BMO Harris Private Banking here in GTA. And on behalf of all my colleagues uh, with BMO, thank you for joining today's event. I'm proud to call Toronto home. It's where I choose to live, to work, and to raise my family. And I imagine most in this room feel similarly. And events like this today, led by the Toronto Foundation, offer us an opportunity to pause and reflect and to re-energize and recommit. To recommit to a word that Rahul used, to recommit to our love of the city, but also to recommit to our role as citizens with a shared responsibility to support each other, our neighborhoods, and indeed all the neighborhoods that in combination make this city vibrant, diverse, and a place that we can be proud to call home. We're well into an election season, and I find inspiration today in seeing the leadership that's here in this room. I've really enjoyed the combination today that we heard from Rahul of fact and passion, the illustration of deficiencies, but more importantly, the offer of meaningful and collaborative solutions. And I'd ask you all to join me in thanking one of our very best leaders, Rahul Bardwaj, and his entire team for sharing his insights and for inspiring us. <laughs> Rahul, I've got to say on a personal note, it's generally after a large lunch at this time of day that I start getting distracted by thinking about my commute home and just how terrible that might be. You, you captivated me, and I think you captivated the room, and thank you. For many years, BMO has proudly supported the Toronto Foundation, and specifically the Vital Signs Research. We're proud to be sponsoring this. And we believe in its value to generate public discourse, and we're thrilled to see how steadily this event has grown, both in stature and in its impact. Indeed, this is the largest Vital Signs event that we've participated in since the early 2000s. At BMO, we consider ourselves fortunate to be able to direct our personal and our company's time, energy, and resources towards our communities. And importantly, we rely on foundations and community foundations like ours here in Toronto to give us guidance as to where support is most needed and where it will be most effective. I'll end by returning to the mandate of Toronto Vital Signs, which is to inspire civic engagement, provide focus for public debate, and to guide donors and stakeholders who want to direct their resources to the areas of greatest need. I hope that you'll leave today feeling as I do, that the Toronto Foundation has fulfilled this mandate and more. Armed with today's insights, we all share the opportunity and I'd say the responsibility to build a better Toronto. Thank you for joining us today and I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. I'd like to echo Ryan's message and thank Raul for the insightful presentation today. And our sincere thanks once again to today's event sponsor, BMO Harris Private Banking, for making this possible. Before I adjourn today's meeting, I'd like to draw your attention to our event survey card on each of your tables. The Canadian Club is always looking for ways to improve your experience, so please take a minute to help us by sharing your thoughts and comments including whether you like our new shortened luncheon format. We very much appreciate your feedback. This concludes our program today. Please visit the Canadian Club website to download a webcast and podcast of today's event. To learn more about the club and our upcoming events, please visit us at www.canadianclub.org. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.